Welcome to Fashion And with me, Scott Schiavone, Fashion Curator. Just a reminder that you can keep up to date with everything Fashion And by following at Fashion And with Scott Schiavone on Instagram and by hitting that subscribe button. This episode is dedicated to one of the most enigmatic fashion designers of the 20th century. This is Fashion and Charles James. America's greatest couturier, the world's best and only dressmaker who has raised it from an applied art to a pure art form. Charles James is revered as one of the most significant couturiers of the 20th century. Christian Dior cited him as the inspiration for his groundbreaking 1947 New Look collection and, as our opening quote states, Balenciaga thought him the greatest couturier in the world. Charles James is among a handful of fashion designers who can be said to have truly transformed the field in which they worked. Known for his fabulously expensive and dramatic gowns, his designs incorporated the essence of modernity but still made reference to elements of historicism. He was influenced by Victorian corsets, bustles and crinolines and the elegance and opulence of the Edwardian era. Part of James's identity was the limited number of shapes and silhouettes he designed, but the numerable versions of them that exist. He was an obsessive perfectionist, continuously pushing the boundaries of convention and his own previous accomplishments. He viewed his design output as artistic creation. He was an artist and an architect who just happened to be working with fashion as his medium. In this episode, we will be exploring the life and work of Charles James through four themes. Becoming the man, the science of fashion, defining silhouettes, and James post-fashion. Widely considered the only true American couturier, Charles James has achieved an almost cult-like status, not only for his exquisite creations, but also for his dramatic life and complex personality. Charles Wilson Brega James was born on the 18th of July 1906. His mother was a wealthy Chicago socialite who was admired for her style and beauty and his father was a captain in the British military. From his late teens onwards, James identified as gay, causing his relationship with his father to become distraught. The conflict would push James to succeed. He said, I attempted the impossible out of a compulsion to be involved in a business of which my father disapproved. In 1924, James was sent to Chicago to work in the architectural department of electrical company Commonwealth Edison, where he learned about architectural and engineering concepts that he would later apply to his dressmaking. Establishing his millinery business, Boucheron, in 1926, James approached his work like a sculptor, making hats in unconventional, asymmetric forms and cutting and moulding the materials directly onto the client's head. In 1928, he moved to New York, but two years later, returned to London and established a couture salon in Mayfair. Due to his proximity to Europe, he would regularly travel to Paris and exchange design ideas with other designers such as Poiré, Dior, Schiaparelli and Balenciaga. James rebelled against the fluid and figure-hugging styles of the 1930s and, using stiffer fabrics, unique cuts, padding and understructures, created a series of evening coats which were photographed by his lifelong friend Cecil Beaton. James moved back to New York in 1939, where he established his atelier at 699 Madison Avenue. From his studio, he worked in the pure couture tradition, designing, fitting and creating new styles for America's most prominent and stylish women. Did you say stylish? Why, thank you. The evening dresses James produced between 1947 and 1954 are the epitome of post-war elegance and glamour. Cecil Beaton's 1948 photograph for Vogue magazine of elegantly poised models dressed in James's gowns, engaging with each other or narcissistically checking themselves in mirrors best encapsulates this and is one of my favourite fashion images of all time. 
As a man, James could be charming and unpredictable. His quest for artistic perfection and his personal demons gave him a difficult temperament and unreasonable disposition. His life was full of drama, characterised by constant shifts of fortune, declarations of bankruptcy and perpetual cycles of reinvention. He basically fell out with all of his friends, including Diana Vreeland and Cecil Beaton. And despite being openly gay, in 1954, James married Nancy Lee Gregory, who was 20 years his junior. He had a son and daughter and then divorced in 1961. Despite all the drama, his loyal clients flocked to be dressed by him and went to great lengths to support him artistically and financially. After his death, loyal client and journalist Austin Hirsch wrote, He was a selfish egoist, a renaissance man, and a wonderfully complex genius who broke his heart and his health, wanting to become financially successful in the mass market of clothes. Having had no formal training in dressmaking, Charles James based his practice on the disciplines of mathematics, architecture and sculpture. His primary design focus was on creating a more accurate fit and flattering line by rethinking dressmaking conventions regarding the placement of seams, darts and the grain of fabrics. James used the female form as a point of reference rather than a defining factor and some of his designs through cut, construction and manipulation of fabric divided and distorted the body. Some designs enhanced and idealised the body's natural form with interior padding, boning and drapery, and others reshaped the body into fantastical forms and silhouettes using complex understructures. He used expressive shapes and complex seam lines, spiral draping and wrapping, asymmetry and differently coloured layers. He placed delicate chiffons against stiffened satin or silk velvet over coarse canvas and used principles of engineering and architecture to provide structural support to these unlikely combinations. James believed that his research and development of new approaches to the creation of a garment were worthy of preservation and study and as early as the 1940s encouraged his clients to donate their James designs to the Brooklyn Museum. Some donors also gave patterns and toiles so the museum could document the process of creation. I have seen these toiles on display in museums and they are some of the greatest sculptures I have ever seen. Charles James elevated fashion into a fine art, combining the science of nature, mathematics, architecture and engineering with the visual aesthetics of fashion. Charles James designed with the philosophy that there were a limited number of basic forms but an infinite number of variations. In this section, I'll be highlighting some of my favourite Charles James silhouettes, their innovative design and construction. James first conceived the spiral design in 1929 as a dress that could be taken off or put on without having to put it over your head. The dress could be wrapped around the body and fastened with a clasp at the hip. It was named the taxi dress for its provocative suggestion that a woman could slip in or out of it even in the confines of a cab. The dress was revolutionary and epitomised a new modernity. Its wraparound style foreshadowed the many versions of wrap dresses that would follow decades later. The white silk evening jacket, designed in Paris in 1938, was padded with eiderdown and quilted in a pattern of rounded arabesques. Influenced by sculptural forms, the jacket was constructed in the same manner as an eiderdown quilt. To make it easier for the wearer to move, James reduced the depth of the padding around the neckline and the armholes. This jacket ranks among his most important works, only one was ever made. However, its concept and shape anticipated the evolution of the puffer jacket. Not only one of the first strapless evening dresses designed by Charles James, but also the first known evening garment with an understructure built into the skirt. 
Like an umbrella, the design used silk encased ribs to form an understructure that in turn supports the fullness of the skirt created by eight gourd panels. Long darts horizontally placed at the mid-calf take up the fabric to form the pointed lobes of the skirt and horizontal interior bones support its silhouette while at the same time amplifying its sway in movement. This dressing gown is made from ribbons uncut from head to toe to articulate the contours of the body. Using mathematical precision, James gradually tapered the ribbons to accommodate the fitted waist, and then reversed it to produce space for the bust. James elaborated upon this idea to produce a ball gown. The vanishing point tapers of the gourd skirt from hem to waist of this ball gown convey James's mastery of his seeming techniques whilst accentuating the female form. Transcending time and fashion trends, James produced this dress from the late 1930s to the mid-1950s. The design remains true to the sexy and slinky 1930s silhouette, but moves away from the biased cut sheath dresses of the 1930s in cut, construction and attitude. The tapered front spine-like element produced by a series of upward horizontal pleats adds an edgy anatomical feature slightly representative of crustacean, reflected in the dress's nickname, the lobster dress. The figure-hugging bodice is constructed with a boned foundation extended to below the waist. The shoulder straps are extensions of the back bodice and unusual folding and darting draws attention to the bust. The challenge of this dress, James noted, was to achieve an elegant effect despite the difficulty of mounting a voluminous flounce of stiff silk thigh on a narrow sheath of supple black satin. The wide gathered tulip shaped hem at the back frees the legs to allow the wearer to walk while still retaining the tapered silhouette at the front. James said that only a woman of great distinction could carry the dress's contrasting moods of sobriety and suggestiveness. Borrowing from the Victorians, James reinterpreted the 1870s bustle dress in construction, form and decoration. The chiffon of the bodice is tucked into place over a silk satin ground and the apron front drapery is manipulated so that its folds are not fixed but difficult to disrupt. A bustle-like structure at the back and padding causes the rear and hips to extend beyond the natural form and the protrusion of the rear suggests the back of a swan with wings folded gracefully upon its back. The layers of variously coloured tulle evoke ruffled feathers and combine to give a depth and luminosity to the skirt, especially when in motion. Corsetry was one of James's lifelong fascinations, and the designer used corsetry and rigid boning to perfect this quintessential feminine shape. The name of this gown is both a reference to Marietta Tree, the socialite for whom it was produced, and to an actual tree, the silhouette of which, when turned upside down, the gown resembles. This dress merges body and skirt in one continuous drift of downward folds. As an added touch of sheer romanticism, the bouffant skirt is faced with rich white satin and supported by a plethora of coloured tulle, a hidden secret only made visible when the garment is in motion. Surreal, seductive, modern but with a clear reference to 1880s Victorian silhouettes, as the name implies, this dress transforms the female body into that of an insect with iridescent wings which shimmer with movement. Composed of a tight figure-hugging sheath with an exuberant explosion of tulle, the wing effect of the butterfly is further enhanced with the addition of satin side panels which loop over and control the exuberant volume of tulle a design feature that not only heightens the eroticism of the wearer's curves, but also hides the structural attachments of the various dress parts. Despite references to the past, this silhouette was entirely unknown in the history of fashion, giving the gown an absolute edge of modernism. 
Charles James considered this gown to be his crowning achievement. It's an aesthetic and technical masterpiece. James created this dress in 1953 for Austin Hearst to attend the Eisenhower inaugural ball. However, the dress was not completed in time and instead was worn to Queen Elizabeth II's coronation ball in London. The influence for this dress is the supported cage crinoline silhouettes of the 1860s, however its construction is far more complex. The bodice features James's signature asymmetric tucks, the waistline curves up over the side waist and dips very low in the back and front. The cantilevered skirt has three structurally distinct parts, the upper part of white satin to match the bodice, a wide band of black velvet with top and bottom curves verging in different directions, and a hem of white silk fibre. Implementing his architectural mind into the design, the skirt is balanced on the hips, levitates away from the body and does not touch the ground. Another, slightly more romantic version of this dress was made using pink satin, copper silk and an overlay of sprawling black lace. Charles James closed his atelier in 1958 after New York City officials seized the contents of his office to settle creditors' judgments against him. A few years later, in collaboration with the curator of the Brooklyn Museum's design laboratory, Charles James devised a seminar called The Calculus of Fashion, which was designed to be, to a fashion student, what advanced calculus is to a mathematics student. In 1964, James moved into New York's infamous Chelsea Hotel. It was during these years that he began working with fashion illustrator Antonio Lopez and art director Juan Ramos to document his life's work. Throughout the 60s, 70s and 80s, in a series of vivid drawings and photographs, Antonio revived James's designs, presenting them in magazines and on models such as Pat Cleveland. In 1970, James was hired by his protégé, Halston, whom he had known since 1958 as a fashion consultant engineer, to assist him in improving the cut and shape of his clothing. Their working relationship soon turned sour, and in 1975, Charles James wrote an article for Metropolis magazine accusing the younger designer of plagiarism, referring to Halston as that thief, that copycat. It is true that much of Holson's work, such as his bias-cut tubular dresses and angular necklines, are undeniably influenced by Charles James. In September 1978, Charles James fell ill and was taken to hospital. A few days later, he was transferred to Cabrini Medical Centre on the evening of the 22nd of September. He famously kept the ambulance drivers waiting so he could freshen up his appearance, saying, it may not mean anything to you, but I am what is popularly regarded as the greatest couturier in the world. Charles James died the very next day, on the 23rd of September, 1978. In May 2014, the retrospective exhibition Charles James Beyond Fashion at the Metropolitan Museum reignited interest in the designer and introduced him to an entirely new generation of fashion enthusiasts. Around the same time, there was discussion with investors and with the James estate to revive the brand, with Zach Posen, largely considered James's true successor in American fashion, as the artistic director of the brand, a project that sadly never came to fruition. Charles James remains forever associated with obsessive perfectionism, impeccable design and a bygone era of sophistication and glamour a world now only accessible through fashion books and museum exhibitions. Revered as one of the most significant couturiers of the 20th century, Charles James is among a handful of fashion designers who can be said to have truly transformed the field in which they worked. Christian Dior cited him as the inspiration for his new look, and Balenciaga regarded him as the greatest couturier in the world. Charles James was an obsessive perfectionist who believed that excellence could always be elevated and enhanced. Best known for his fabulously expensive and dramatic gowns, as well as his temperamental and difficult personality, he was an artist, an architect, a sculptor, 
whose chosen medium was fashion. Well, that's it for the extraordinary life and talent of fashion and Charles James. I'll see you next time, but before you go, don't forget to subscribe to Fashion and with me, Scott Schiavone, fashion curator.